The year 1921 signifies an important transition in the evolution of the Baha'i faith. This was the year that Abdul Baha left this earthly plane. Friends, the time is coming that I shall be no longer with you. I have done all that could be done. I have served the cause of Baha'u'llah to the utmost of my ability. I have labored night and day all the years of my life. Oh, how I long to see the friends shouldering the responsibilities of the cause. Remember, whether or not I be on earth, my presence will be with you always. But who was this man that was loved and respected by so many, by rich and poor, Muslim and Christian, by the highest and lowest in society? What was it like to be in his presence? The famous Orientalist Edward Granville Brown, who met him in 1890, so described him. Seldom have I seen one whose appearance impressed me more. A tall, strongly built man, holding himself straight as an arrow, with white turban and raiment, long black locks reaching almost to the shoulder, combined with an unswerving will, eyes keen as a hawk's, and strongly marked but pleasant features. Such was my first impression of Abbas Effendi, the master. What kind of popularity was it that would cause, within a day of his passing and in an age of limited communication, more than 10,000 to gather and mourn the one they knew as Abbas Effendi? Palestine had never seen such an outpouring of grief. The master was a father to the poor and a physician to the sick an example and counsellor to the high and mighty, and a loving brother to all who crossed his path. He was so loved, so admired, with quality so extraordinary, that his own father, Baha'u'llah, considered him a marvel, and titled him Serullah, the mystery of God. But he himself insisted on simply being known as Abdul Baha, the servant of Baha. His spiritual sensitivity, profound humility, and utter consecration for others were legendary. His own sister and mother often said that, if you are not watchful, he would give everything we possess away to others in need. On one such occasion, he tried to give away the rug under their feet, at which point his sister intervened, saying, If you give this remaining rug away, you will have to give me away too. Abdul Baha, whose given name was Abbas, was born on May the 23rd, 1844, into an illustrious family in the city of Tehran in Persia, now Iran. On the very eve of his birth, miles away in the southern city of Shiraz, a young merchant named Ali Muhammad declared that he, the Bab, was the promised one whose return the Muslims had been expecting for some 1,300 years. The Bab's message heralding the day of him whom God shall make manifest struck a chord with people in Persia and attracted a broad spectrum of society to his faith. It also provoked opposition, leading to the persecution and death of tens of thousands of his followers and culminating in the Bab's own martyrdom in 1850. At this time, Abdul Baha was six years old. His mother's name was Asiya Khanum, and his father, who in later years would become known as Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, was called Mirza Hussein Ali. Abbas had been named after his grandfather, Mirza Bozorge Nouri, a vizier in the court of the monarch Fatali Shah. His childhood had been privileged, and he had grown up in a beautiful mansion surrounded by gardens and orchards. His parents, mindful of their responsibilities, shared their wealth with the poor 
and needy, and Mirza Hossein Ali was widely known as the father of the poor. But all that was to change within a few short years. It was during those early years of his life and the Babi faith that the poet and heroine Tahere was a guest under the roof of Baha'u'llah. He himself describes how she held him as a little boy on her lap and conversed with him. It was also during those early years that the historian Nabil Zarandi recounts how the little Abbas took his hand and accompanied him around his family home, showing him all the rooms. During the hot days of summer, he sometimes slept outside in his grandfather's garden and rode horses with his father in the cool, lush mountains. One day, before he was eight, Abbas went to visit shepherds who tended his father's sheep. They invited Abbas to share their meal. After they had eaten, the head shepherd told Abbas that it was the custom for a guest to leave a present for the shepherds. He thought for a while and then gave away all the sheep to them. When Baha'u'llah heard the news, he laughed and said that his son needed someone to watch over him, otherwise he might give himself away. The sibling closest to him was Bahiyye, his younger sister by three years. In 1903, she provided a full account of their time spent together. In August 1852, an attempt was made on the life of the Shah. The failed assassination by a deranged Barbi youth caused an uproar in the city. All the followers of the Bab were targeted for reprisals, and the house of Baha'u'llah was sacked and looted. There we gathered together some furniture, which had been left by the mob, and lived in one room destitute of all but the barest necessities. Baha'u'llah, who took the brunt of the blame, was forced to walk from Neyavaran to Tehran, a distance of 15 miles. In the burning heat of a summer day, bareheaded, barefooted and in chains, with crowds hurling stones and insults at him along the way. Together with 80 other Barbies, Baha'u'llah was thrown into the infamous Siachal, the black pit of Tehran, with a chain around his neck infamous for its galling weight. The little boy had a deep longing to see his father. With the help of a friendly guard, he was carried into this dungeon on the shoulders of a servant. Down they went, down and still further down two flights of steps until they reached a long pitch black corridor. The prison was a disused water system under the palace. The air was fetid, foul with stench, the darkness pitch. Some 150 souls, including thieves and assassins, were crowded in that hole. As Abdul Baha explained at the very bottom, when he could see nothing, we heard his blessed voice, do not bring him here, and so we returned. Baha'u'llah, expecting imminent execution as leader of the Barbies, was instead reserved for the more horrible suffering of witnessing the successive torture and death of his companions one after the other. To keep up their spirits, Baha'u'llah had his companions chant a refrain antiphonally throughout the night, one group singing, God is sufficient unto me, he is the all-sufficing, and the other responding with, in him let the trusting trust. 140 years later, at the 1992 Baha'i World Congress in New York, some 30,000 participants heard that same chant re-echoing on the other side of the planet.
Four months passed in this state of fearful agony. Four months during which the government investigated Baha'u'llah's connection with the attack on the life of the Shah, and the family lived in suspense and terror. According to Bahia Khanum, one day, in the course of these months, we found Abbas Effendi surrounded by a band of boys who had undertaken to personally molest him. He was standing in their midst, firmly but quietly commanding them not to lay their hands upon him, which, strange to say, they seemed unable to do. And it was during these four months, here in this vermin-infested dungeon, with his neck bowed down by chains, that Baha'u'llah received the first intimation of his mission. In that pitch-black, fetid darkness, a maiden appeared before him, imparting tidings of his station, communicating his spiritual sovereignty, announcing God's message for this day. Following his release months later, Bahia Khanum commented, we saw a new radiance seeming to enfold him like a shining vesture. Its significance we were to learn years later. Although the government's investigation found no connection between Baha'u'llah and the attack on the life of the Shah, it decided to exile him and his family to Baghdad under strict military escort. The season was bitterly cold, and the route lay over mountains. The convoy moved with painful slowness, covering only several miles a day, so that the journey lasted three months. Baha'u'llah was very ill and weak. The chains had left his neck galled, raw and swollen. As Bahia Khanum later recalled, we were all insufficiently clothed and suffered keenly from exposure. My brother in particular was very thinly clad, riding upon a horse, his feet, ankles, hands and wrists, much exposed to the cold, became frostbitten and swollen. The effects of this experience he feels to this day on being chilled or having a cold. We arrived in Baghdad, in a state of great misery, Bahia Khanum later recorded, and also of almost utter destitution. During these early years, Abbas Effendi had recognized the glory of his father's station and did everything possible to serve him. He also frequented the mosques and coffee houses at that time and debated with the doctors and learned men he met there. They were astonished at his knowledge and acumen. He came to be known among them as the youthful sage. They would ask him, who is your teacher? Where do you learn the things which you say? His reply was that his father had taught him. Although he had never been to school, he was as proficient in all that was taught and more knowledgeable as a youth than most well-educated men. Those who knew him would often remark on his beauty, as his sister recalls. In appearance, my brother was at this time a remarkably fine-looking youth. During the years in Baghdad, Baha'u'llah's fame continued to grow, with streams of visitors from Iraq and further afield seeking his presence. His fame spread so far that the Persian authorities, aided by Baha'u'llah's jealous half-brother Mirza Yahya, brought pressure on the Ottoman Sultan for a further exile to Constantinople present-day Istanbul. Twelve days prior to his departure, in a garden he called Rezvan, or Paradise, amongst the roses and nightingales across the river Tigris, Baha'u'llah declared himself to be the one foretold by the Bab, the one whom God shall make manifest, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. That day, the 21st of April, 1863, is celebrated annually by Baha'is worldwide as Rezvan, the most important festival of their faith. After a 12-day sojourn in the Garden of Rizvan on the 2nd of May, 1863, 
Baha'u'llah's second banishment began a decade after his exile from Persia. Abdul Baha, forewarned of his father's station, had immediately taken the role of special attendant, servant and bodyguard for him. During the journey to Constantinople, he watched over him day and night, riding by his wagon and guarding close by his tent when he was resting. In order to get a little sleep himself, after first reassuring himself of his father's well-being, he adopted the plan of riding fast ahead of the caravan and then dismounting at a considerable distance away. He would then make his horse lie down and with his head on his horse's neck would sleep a little until the cavalcade reached them, at which point his horse would kick him and he would wake up and remount. Bahia Khanum described his routine. Every night he was the first to arrive at the campsite and arrange for food and water, then stayed up all night looking for further fresh supplies. They reached Constantinople by mid-August and Bahá'u'lláh was received with much deference and respect. But by December, only four months later, a further exile took place, instigated by his ill wishes. This time he was banished to the furthermost corner of Turkey, to the city of Adrianople, modern-day Adirna. Here they spent a miserable winter surviving on bare necessities, and here too Abbas Effendi did his utmost to protect his father from Mirza Yahya. The machinations of Baha'u'llah's jealous half-brother had now taken a more somber turn. He was plotting against Baha'u'llah's life and finally poisoned his food. The attempt was almost fatal. Filled with grief, Abbas put his head on Baha'u'llah's pillow and begged him to live. Though his father could not speak, he laid his hand gently on Abbas's head. Baha'u'llah did recover, but his hand shook forever after because of the poison, and it affected his handwriting. During his time in Adrianople, Abbas Effendi mingled with men of all religious backgrounds and endeared himself to high and low alike. Even the governor became a friend and delighted to listen to his discourse. It was from this time that he began to be called the master. When the governor received the Sultan's order in 1868 of sending the exiles still further and banishing Baha'u'llah from Adrianople, Bahia Khanum writes that he was so affected by it that not having the heart to execute it himself, he put it into the hands of his subordinates, wrote a letter to Abbas Effendi and left the city. One day, unexpectedly, a cordon of soldiers surrounded the residence of Baha'u'llah. A bugle was sounded and Abbas Effendi was handed the governor's letter. Stunned by the edict which imposed banishment on the exiles to different places, he responded that, We would rather die than be separated. The commanding officer retorted that they would all go that same day and would be forcibly parted. But Abbas Effendi demanded to see the representative of the governor. He insisted that a telegraph be sent to Constantinople, appealing for a common banishment at the very least. The reply was negative, but Abbas Effendi remained resolute. He refused to take no for an answer and continued to send more dispatches to the capital, eloquently pleading their case. The family was in turmoil. The master seemed to be making no headway. Would they have to be scattered and separated from their beloved Baha'u'llah? Finally, Abbas Effendi demanded the presence of the governor, who in the meanwhile had returned to the city. When he came and saw the state they were in, 
he communicated to Sultan Abdul Aziz himself. It is impossible, he wrote. We cannot separate these people. The next day, a reply came, granting permission for the entire family of Baha'u'llah and his followers to leave all together. But no one knew where they were to be sent. At the height of the summer in August 1868, less than five years after their midwinter arrival in Adrianople, Baha'u'llah, his family, and about 70 companions arrived at the port of Gallipoli. Initially ignorant of their destination and even less certain of their fate, they then set sail across the Mediterranean for the city of Alexandria in Egypt, where they found themselves crowded onto a smaller ship with little food and even less water, for the ordeal was not over yet. After 11 more gruelling days, they finally arrived at the port city of Haifa, where they were once again transferred to even smaller sailboats, which drifted with agonizing slowness for eight long hours under the scorching sun across the burning bay to Acre. By the time they reached the notorious penal colony of the Ottoman Empire, many of the exiles were at the limit of their endurance. And here, at the sea gate of the city, they were told they had to wade ashore across the rocks. When the women protested against it, the governor gave orders to carry them unceremoniously on the backs of the stevedores. Abdu'l-Bahá rejected the order. Among the first to land, he quickly acquired a chair, which was used to carry the women ashore with dignity. It was short-lived. They were stoned as they walked under escort through the narrow streets. Abuse was hurled at them all the way to the barracks. Knee-deep in filth, they passed under the barred doors and into the prison. And then the bolts were finally drawn behind them. Some were famished with hunger. All were parched with thirst. Abdu'l-Bahá begged to be permitted to get food and water, but the soldiers would not allow it threatening to kill anyone setting foot outside the prison. But the master was not so easily discouraged. He negotiated patiently, argued diplomatically, and after a few hours managed to send an appeal to the governor. At last, some brackish water and cooked rice were provided, which only those with the strongest stomachs could support. Soon, the combination of sultry heat, damp cells, and acute physical depletion led to an outbreak of typhoid fever and dysentery among the prisoners. All of them, except for Abdu'l-Bahá, his mother, and one of his aunts, fell desperately sick within days. But no physicians nor any medicines were allowed to them. However, the master had some quinine and bismuth with him. These and his constant care enabled most of the sick to survive. According to Bahir Khanum, he washed the patients, fed them, nursed them and watched over them. He took no rest. In spite of his vigilance, however, four of the prisoners died. When he had brought the rest of us through the crisis, continues Bahir Khanum, and we were out of danger, utterly exhausted, he fell sick himself. Even when death did not stalk among them, Life in the prison was difficult for the exiles. The guards maintained strict control within and without the walls. One evening, Mirza Mehdi, Abdu'l-Bahá's younger brother, had climbed up on the roof to say his prayers in the open air. As he walked back and forth in the twilight, his eyes lifted up to the starry skies. He lost his balance 
and fell through a skylight in the roof. The distance to the floor below was great, and the wooden crate on which he fell pierced his ribs so badly that the doctor who was summoned could do nothing for him. It was a devastating blow to the entire family who huddled around him. According to Bahia Khanum, their father gave him a choice during those last hours. Baha'u'llah gently asked him, What do you desire? Do you wish to live or do you prefer to die? Tell me what you most wish for. My brother replied, I don't care to live. I have but one wish. I want the believers to be admitted to see their Lord. If you will promise me this, it is all I ask. Baha'u'llah assured his son that it would be as he desired. After much patient suffering, continues Bahia Hanum, my brother's gentle spirit took its flight. As we could not leave the barracks, we could not bury our dead, nor had we the means to purchase a coffin. We told our Lord of the sad situation. He replied that there was a rug in his room which we could sell. At first we demurred, for in taking his rug, we took the only comfort he had, but he insisted, and we sold it. The death of this youngest and favorite child, of a very gentle and sweet disposition, nearly broke his mother's heart. As in so many other matters, it devolved upon Abdu'l-Bahá once more to undertake the difficult arrangements at this time. It was he who had to negotiate with unscrupulous gravediggers for the burial of his own brother. After just over two years, the exiles were moved out of the fortress itself to make room for a newly arrived regiment who needed the barracks. Baha'u'llah and his family were then placed within the narrow confines of the house of Abud and detained inside the city walls for the next seven years. Many significant events took place in this house, including the revelation by Baha'u'llah in 1873 of the Kitab al-Aqdas, the most holy book of the Baha'i dispensation. Another event also took place here, which marked a more modest change in Abdul Baha's life and alleviated the family's circumstances. Bahia Khanum and her mother had been eager for the master to marry for some time, and according to Oriental custom, many young girls had been proposed for his consideration. Why should I marry? he invariably asked. Are there not enough to suffer now that we should propose to bring others into the world to share our lot? Eventually, Baha'u'llah intervened. He chose one young woman from among them, called Fatima, whom he named Munire, or Illumined, and calling Abdu'l-Bahá into his room, asked his son if he might bring himself to accept this young woman as his bride. Abdu'l-Bahá naturally consented, and as Bahia Khanum recounts, my brother undoubtedly sacrificed his own preference for a single life to the wishes of the rest of the family, especially his father. There was much rejoicing over this decision. Everyone looked forward to the wedding day, but it was delayed from month to month because of the cramped conditions of the House of Abud. There was simply no suitable room for the newlyweds. Finally, Bahia Khanum approached the landlord, who was a good-natured man, and told him of their predicament. Since he owned the adjoining building, he created an opening in the wall, connecting the two courtyards and providing a furnished room for the young couple in the adjacent house. The master himself made all arrangements for the ceremony, which was performed by his father. But once it was over, he quietly withdrew, for it was his custom to spend each afternoon and evening visiting the poor and sick in Akka. His private concerns, even on an occasion like this, 
could not interfere with these duties. He did not return until after the guests had dispersed. Of the nine children produced by this marriage, only four daughters lived to adulthood. The eldest, Zia Ye Khanum, was later to become the mother of Shoghi Effendi, who was the guardian of the faith. According to Monir Khanum, it is impossible to put into words the delight of being with the master. I seem to be in a glorious realm of sacred happiness whilst in his company. In the youth of his beauty and manly vigor, with his unfailing love, his kindness, his cheerfulness, his sense of humor, his untiring consideration for everybody, he was marvelous without equal, surely in all the earth. Abdul Baha's life in the house of Abud was a strict round of duties and obligations. He would regularly visit the Al Jazar Mosque to offer prayers and mingled with all who sought his advice, whether high or low. In addition to his own acts of daily charity, he maintained a rigorous correspondence and also produced numerous literary works at this time. One of these, a treatise written in 1875 titled The Secret of Divine Civilization, was ostensibly addressed to the rulers and people of Persia. It was published anonymously and widely distributed at its time. In fact, the treatise was a wake-up call to jolt Persia out of her slumber of fanaticism, to awaken her to the exigencies of the modern world. Abdu'l-Bahá wrote, at his father's prompting and under his guidance, that a well-balanced understanding of the world and its people was only possible through progressive education through a quest for knowledge and technological advancement. These, he stated, were the means to lead a nation to its material revival and spiritual enlightenment. Apart from all his other activities, Abdul Baha was also an indispensable liaison between his father and the city officials during his imprisonment. The governor, Mezat Pasha, who was a former Grand Vizier and would in later years promote democracy in his country, developed, as did so many others, a great respect for Abdul Baha. Through the master's intervention, this same governor finally permitted Baha'u'llah the freedom to leave the city walls in 1877 and allowed him to visit the surrounding countryside. Knowing his father had not seen any green for nine years, Abdul Baha rented a country house alongside a stream for him in Mazraya, four miles outside the city. He also prepared a beautiful garden for Baha'u'llah in memory of the Garden of Rezvan, which Baha'u'llah called his Emerald Isle. And after two years, he rented the magnificent mansion of Bahji on the outskirts of Akka, where Baha'u'llah would live out the last days of his life. In order to enable his father to devote his time entirely to revealing tablets and conducting correspondence, the master remained in Akka to meet the day-to-day -day demands of officials and oversee the needs of the community. He became well known for his wisdom and knowledge. Even the governor approached him for advice on various matters, although the master was still formally his prisoner. He was sought out by all kinds of people, men and women who had family issues or who were wrongly accused of crimes, who had financial needs, or who were desperate for someone to be their advocate before a judge. Some lived in poverty and were simply in need of food or shelter. Some were sick, and since there was no hospital in Akka, the master paid a physician to look after those needing most care. He actually provided this doctor, Nikolai Bey, with a regular salary requesting him not to divulge its source to others. Through such practices, the master uplifted the spirits and helped to educate and set standards of personal conduct for all to emulate, whether they happened to be Baha'is or not. On one occasion, he took the public coach, which had several stops. On embarking, the bus driver suggested perhaps a private carriage would be more suitable for a man of his stature. During the ride, a fisherwoman came to the master in distress, saying she had caught nothing all day. He gave her five francs and turned to the driver and said, you now see the reason why I would not take a private carriage? 
Why should I ride in luxury when so many are starving? He always put the concerns of others over the comfort of himself. Once, Bahir Khanum and Munire Khanum conspired together to buy him a fine cloak as he often wore very rough clothing. Munire Khanum procured the necessary money from her brother and provided a tailor with the cloth to make the garment. Unfortunately, the tailor bungled the job, and when it became known to the master, Abdul Baha sent for his brother in law. You must sell that cloak, he said, and charge me for the loss, whatever it may be. Such an amount of money will buy four cloaks, one of which is good enough for me, the others can be given away. Abdul Baha frequently walked on foot from Akka to Bahji to visit his father. Baha'u'llah would be so eager to see him that he would frequently stand on the balcony in anticipation, looking out for his beloved son. The walk was long and very oppressive in the summer heat. Sometimes overcome with sunstroke or fatigue, the master would lie down on the ground and rest his head on a stone for a while. When Baha'u'llah asked why he did not ride to Bahji on a horse instead, Abdul Baha replied, how can I come to my Lord riding? It was his habit, even when he rode on his donkey, to dismount as soon as he was within sight of the mansion in order to walk the remaining half mile towards his beloved. When Christ went out, he walked and slept in the fields, he used to say. Who am I that in visiting my Lord I should go as greater than Christ? Whenever Baha'u'llah saw his beloved son approaching, he would call out with joy, for the servants to go out and conduct him to the mansion with all honour and respect. The passing of Baha'u'llah in the early hours of the 29th of May, 1892, was a cause of grieving for the whole family. Their helper, their sustainer, their support was gone. Who would shelter them now? Who would protect them? But for Abdul Baha, the loss was irreparable. It was a massive blow, for his father was the object of his adoration, the Lord he worshipped. He was also the closest person to him on this earth. And now he was gone, Abdul Baha was alone with his sorrow. The sun of Baha has set were the powerful and simple words he sent to Sultan Abdul Hamid to convey the news. It was immediately spread far and wide. And a multitude from Akka and the neighboring villages soon flocked to Bachi and thronged the fields surrounding the mansion, weeping and lamenting their grief. All through the following week, a vast number of mourners, rich and poor alike, came to convey condolences and partake of the food lavishly dispensed under the directions of Abdul Baha. Government officials, poets and religious leaders of all sects unitedly joined to lament the loss and magnify the virtues and greatness of Baha'u'llah. He was buried in a house next to the mansion of Bachi, the holiest spot towards which Baha'is the world over would turn in prayer forever after. Nine days after his passing, Abdul Baha called for the will of Baha'u'llah, the Kitab Ad, or the Book of the Covenant, to be read aloud in the presence of all the friends and the family in Bachi. In it, Baha'u'llah named Abdul Baha, the master, the mystery of God, to assume his mantle as head of the faith, as interpreter of his writings, as exemplar and center of his covenant.
One year after the ascension of Baha'u'llah in 1892, the echoes of his name reverberated across the Western world. The Reverend Henry Jessup at the World Columbia Exposition in Chicago made reference to the Baha'i faith for the first time in an address to the World Parliament of Religions in 1893. It was like a signal, the start of a new chapter in the history of the faith, coinciding precisely with the beginning of the ministry of the Master. The next 29 years were to prove tumultuous in every sense, for the world, for the fledgling cause, and for Abdul Baha himself. Not long after the name of the Baha'i faith was noised abroad, the number of its adherents began to grow. Its admirers were soon estimated to be in the thousands, especially in America. And as its fame spread in the West, pernicious rumors multiplied about Abdul Baha in the East. And the officials of an increasingly unstable Ottoman Empire began to scrutinize his activities with growing unease. Unfortunately, their paranoia was incited by enemies closer to home. While still in mourning for his father, the master had to contend with the ever more willful and bitter jealousy of his half-brother, Muhammad Ali. But this was also a tumultuous time of hope as well as of anxiety, of expanding horizons as the ripples of the faith spread wide. In 1898, the first group of Western pilgrims reached the prison city of Akka to visit the master. It was the first time that Baha'is from Europe and America had ever met Abdul Baha in person, and his spiritual impact on them was profound. This relatively young group, consisting mainly of women from high society, was organized and led by Mrs. Phoebe Hurst, the philanthropist and wife of Senator George Hurst. She was the mother of William Randolph Hurst, the well-known newspaper magnate, and their arrival provoked considerable alarm among the Ottoman authorities. Their apprehensions would finally lead to Abdul Baha's reconfinement within the walls of Akka once more and would ultimately threaten his very life. But in those heady days at the turn of the century, when the early pilgrims saw the glimmering white stones of the city by the sea for the first time, hope predominated. Amatul Baha Ruhia Khanum, the wife of the guardian of the Baha'i faith, describes what she had heard about those days from her mother first hand. My family were friends, my mother's family, of uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Phoebe Hurst. And Mrs. Hurst heard, I think from Lua Getzinger, um, about all they knew about the Baha'i faith in the whole Western world at that time, that there was a prisoner in the prison city the Turkish prison city of Akka, who held the key to the door of peace, which was about all they knew of Abdul Baha. And my mother said, I believe, I believe, and fainted dead away. Was, uh, she knew that this was what at last she had found that she'd been looking for all of her girlhood. And uh, then Mrs. Hurst made up a party to go. They were on their way as a party to go to the prison city of Akka and see this prisoner. So she had a, a gold ring and a gold locket and a few trinkets. And she wanted to try and sell these so that she could get the money to go to Akka and see Abdul Baha. And Mrs. Hurst heard about this and she came to my mother and said, May, what's the matter with you? If you want to go to Akka, you could come to Akka with us. And so this is how my mother came on the early pilgrimage, you see. Mr. Robert Turner, the butler of Mrs. Hurst, distinguished himself by becoming the first African-American to accept the Baha'i faith. May Bowles recalled the significance of this in her later memoir. On the morning of our arrival, she wrote, after we had refreshed ourselves, the master summoned us all to him in a long room overlooking the Mediterranean. This was in the house of Abdullah Pasha. He sat in silence, 
gazing out of the window. Then looking up, he asked if all were present. Where is Robert? In a moment, Robert's radiant face appeared in the doorway, and the master rose to greet him, bidding him be seated, and said, "Your lord loves you. God gave you a black skin and a heart white as snow." Since the master's life was packed with activities, the arrival of the pilgrims, uplifting as it was, added to his many responsibilities. His daily schedule began from early dawn and continued on till midnight. His visits to the sick and poor took place before the family had even risen from bed. By the time he returned home, they were up. His sister, the greatest holy leaf, his wife, and her daughters with their children, and they all said prayers together with him before breakfast. In between the chanting of prayers, tea would be served. And occasionally, the children would also recite prayers in the presence of the master. Next, the steady stream of pilgrims would arrive to meet him, to ask him questions, and to seek his guidance. This historic photograph shows some who came on pilgrimage during those early years: Lua, her husband, and Edward Getzinger, Ethel Rosenberg. Laura Clifford Barney, Harriet Thornburg are seated in the company of a very young Shogi Effendi, the future guardian of the Baha'i faith. Later in the day, the master would spend several hours to meeting with government authorities and people with special requests, as well as more time with the poor and needy. Finally, returning home, he would complete his voluminous correspondence into the late hours of the night. One of the Western believers who visited Akka at this time had a profound impact on the master. He was a young Englishman called Thomas Breakwell, who came to know about the faith through May Bowles in Paris in the summer of 1901. On the third day of his encounter with her, Thomas's yearning to see the master became so intense. That he wrote these words to him, "My Lord, I believe. Forgive me, Thy servant Thomas Breakwell." May Bowles immediately forwarded his message to Abdul Baha, and soon afterwards Thomas travelled to Acre himself with a fellow pilgrim. What happened when he was ushered into that large room to meet the Master was indescribable. He felt an upliftment of spirit. An absolute confirmation in his soul, and his heart seemed to burst within him with a rush of emotion. He was so moved that he was prompted at that moment to confess all to the master. His management of a cotton factory in America, employing child and slave labor, his ambivalence about the benefits he received from it. Abdul Baha instructed Thomas Breakwell to cable his resignation immediately. He obeyed without a moment's hesitation. Intoxicated by this visit, Breakwell returned to Paris a changed man. He found lodgings in an inexpensive neighborhood, and walked everywhere, saving money for the teaching work. He became a guiding light in the Paris community, and was the first Western Baha'i to make a payment to the Hukukula, the fund established by Baha'u'llah for the right of God. According to May Bowles, he was the very embodiment of the Master's words. The star of happiness is in every heart. We must remove the veils so that it may shine forth radiantly. Breakwell communicated regularly with the master secretary, Dr. Yunis Khan, who conveyed the messages of this dear soul to Abdul Baha in Persian. Tragically, within a year of his pilgrimage, Thomas Breakwell succumbed to tuberculosis and died. The master knew instantly. When it happened, to the surprise of Yunus Khan, he anticipated the news before it even arrived, and asked him to translate into English a heart-rending message of love for this radiant being. Oh, Breakwell, oh my dear one, at all times do I call thee to mind. I shall never forget thee. I pray for thee by day and by night, 
I see thee plain before me, as if in open day. O oh, Breakwell, O oh, my dear one. Another significant visitor during these tumultuous years was Laura Barney, an American Baha'i, also residing in Paris. She visited the master in the house of Abdullah Pasha several times between 1904 and 1906. It was at a time when his enemies were making it increasingly difficult for Abdul Baha to be in contact with Westerners. And the machinations of Muhammad Ali about his motives were at their height. And during her legendary conversations with him, which took place over lunch during what he called his tired moments at this stressful time, Laura Dreyfus Barney compiled her book, Some Answered Questions. This important collection of Abdul Baha's replies to a range of questions on human evolution, philosophy, and science, as well as on the prophets of God, the soul, and its immortality, was to become a source of great insight and guidance for the increasing numbers of Baha'is in the West. Abdul Baha also addressed many Christian topics during his lunchtime conversations with this highly intelligent as well as inquisitive woman. He often anticipated her questions before she even asked them. But in the early 1900s, Abdul Baha had many preoccupations. Not only were visits by Western believers causing concern, but construction work on the building to enshrine the remains of the Bab was also creating major difficulties for the master. These blessed remains had finally reached the house of Abdullah Pasha in 1899, after being secretly hidden and transported from place to place in Persia over the past half century. The time had now come to befittingly inter them and the spot chosen for the mausoleum of the Prophet Herald of the Baha'i Faith had been designated by Baha'u'llah himself. He had selected the precise spot on Mount Carmel during a visit to Haifa one year prior to his passing in 1891. The enemies of the faith emboldened by the unscrupulous governor Jamal Pasha were claiming that Abdul Baha's true intentions were nefarious. They were accusing him of building a fort on the slopes of Carmel rather than a mausoleum, a stronghold rather than a shrine, a mountain fastness from which to orchestrate an attack on the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. As the rumors swirled about him, Abdul Baha continued his daily routine without the least concern. It was during this anxious period from 1905 on that Abdul Baha wrote the second part of his will and testament, establishing the Universal House of Justice and the Guardianship as twin institutions. In the face of these grave uncertainties, at a time when there was even talk of his being crucified on the desert sands, he never wavered he continued to work. Eventually, the worst seemed imminent. A ship sent by the Sultan arrived in the Bay of Haifa to apprehend the master. It drifted ominously some distance out to sea, but it never docked. After a while, it was seen inexplicably to turn around, and then, just as inexplicably, it sailed away. The officials who had come to arrest the master had been called back to Constantinople at the very last minute. A coup had erupted in the Ottoman capital, and from that day the standoff between the Sultan and the Young Turks became headline news in multiple journals across the world. Sultan Abdul Hamid was unceremoniously deposed, and as a result of the Young Turks revolution in 1908, Abdul Baha, along with all religious and political prisoners, was finally released. For the first time in his life since the age of six, the Persian exile known as Abbas Effendi by the residents of Akka and Haifa 
the radiant figure called the Master by the Baha'is of both East and West, was released from bondage. Abdul Baha was free, but one last assignment remained, the transferal of the remains of the Bab to the mausoleum within the structure he had built on Mount Carmel. That was completed in a moving ceremony on the 21st of March 1909, which coincided with the start of the new Baha'i year. It was now September 1910, a year after the downfall of Sultan Abdul Hamid and the formal entombment of the remains of the Bab on Mount Carmel. And after six decades of exile and imprisonment, the time had come for Abdul Baha to consecrate his remaining strength on a historic journey to the West, first to Egypt, then to Europe, and finally to America. Although he had to postpone his departure from Egypt owing to illness, by August 1911, he'd embarked for Marseille, and from there he continued on to tonon les bains on the shores of Lac Le Mans, before proceeding to London. Sarah Louisa Blomfield, an early member of the Baha'i faith in England, offered her home as his residence, and here the master met people from all walks of life. Among them was Reverend John Campbell, who invited the master to give his first ever public talk to the congregation at the city temple on September the 10th, 1911. Few of the 2,000 strong congregation present would forget the sight of the venerable figure, clad in Eastern garb, ascending the pulpit stairs to address a gathering. Reverend Campbell introduced him. We, as the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to us and will always be the light of the world, view with sympathy and respect every movement of the Spirit of God in the experience of mankind. And therefore we give greeting to Abdu'l-Bahá in the name of all who share the spirit of our Master and are trying to live their lives in that spirit. Then Abdu'l-Bahá stepped into the pulpit and spoke in Persian. O oh, noble friends! Seekers after God. The gift of God to this enlightened age is the knowledge of the oneness of mankind and of the fundamental oneness of religion. Praise be to God in this country, the standard of justice has been raised. A week later, he delivered a talk at St. John the Divine, where he had been invited by the Archdeacon Wilberforce. This distinguished gentleman was a grandson of the famed abolitionist William Wilberforce, who had been instrumental in ending slavery in 1833, an act of Parliament which won the praise of Baha'u'llah in his tablet to Queen Victoria. To see these two men walking hand in hand all the way down the aisle in this historic building was, according to Lady Blomfield, an unforgettable sight. Abdul Baha's beautiful voice reverberated through the sanctuary, and the translation of his words were read aloud by the Archdeacon. Truly, the East and West have met in this sacred place tonight. As they both passed back down the aisle together towards the vestry, the hymn, O oh God, our help in ages past, was sung by the entire congregation.
Abdul Baha's first visit to London soon drew to a close, and he left for Paris, where the first French believer, Monsieur Hippolyte Dreyfus, had prepared an apartment for him. Situated in the Avenue de Camois, it was sunny and spacious and had been charmingly furnished by Laura Barney. The Eiffel Tower stood within view, and a flight of steps nearby led into the Trocadero Gardens where the master often took solitary, restful walks. The seeds of the very first Baha'i community in Europe had been planted in the French capital in 1898 by May Bowles, one of the early American pilgrims, to visit the master. Now, a decade later, the Baha'i community in the City of Light was well established and there were many requests for meetings with the master. Lady Blomfield and her daughters had followed Abdul Baha to Paris. Together with another Baha'i, they kept careful notes of his talks during those memorable days. The master was very pleased with Paris Talks and encouraged its early publication. After his European tour, the master returned to Ramleh in Egypt for the winter, but the American believers longed for him to visit there too. They sent him thousands of dollars to travel in comfort across the Atlantic on the maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic. But he returned the money, saying that it should be used for charity, and embarked instead on the RMS Cedric on the 25th of March 1912, sailing via Naples to New York. Later, in the course of his American journey, news of the sinking of the Titanic reached him, and he spoke about it at the Washington home of the Hannans on April the 23rd. Abdul Baha described the drowning of so many souls as a disaster, a terrible event, an event saddening to every heart and grieving every spirit. He recalled the many passengers of the Titanic who had voyaged on the Cedric with him as far as Naples, and who had chosen to continue to New York on this famed ship. But although he mourned that so many of our fellow human beings were drowned and had passed beyond this earthly life, he concluded, when I consider this calamity in another aspect, I am consoled by the realization that the worlds of God are infinite, that though they were deprived of this existence, they have other opportunities in the life beyond. Even as Christ had said, in my father's house are many mansions. Mirza Mahmoud Zaghani, who accompanied the master, kept a careful record of all that happened over the course of this 17-day voyage. One day, for example, Abdul Baha was invited to give a talk in the largest hall to more than 1,500 curious fellow travelers on the ship. Among them were many children on whom he showered his love. On Thursday, the 11th of April, the steamer finally approached the shores of America. As the master was breakfasting, dozens of telegrams addressed to him were delivered to the dining room. They were from all the Baha'i assemblies, expressing great joy on his imminent arrival. The approach to New York was impressive. There stood the majestic Statue of Liberty in midwater. And there was the city emerging through the mist at last with its iconic tall buildings. As the ship drew near the quay, two enormous skyscrapers, 45 and 35 stories high, loomed into view. The master referred to them humorously as the minarets of the West. Many Baha'i friends from New York and the surrounding areas were waiting in line on the jetty, waving their hats and handkerchiefs in excitement. The master, however, could not yet disembark, as newspaper reporters had already scrambled on board to interview him. He sent a message to the anxious friends that he would meet them later that day at the home of Edward and Carrie Kinney. In reply to the reporter's queries about his visit, Abdul Baha said, Our object is universal peace and the unity of humankind. I have traveled to Paris and London, and now I have come to America to meet with those who seek universal peace. And I hope that the peace societies of America will take the lead in promoting this end. When they asked him how this peace could be achieved, Abdul Baha answered, its realization is through the attraction and support of world public opinion. Today, universal peace is the panacea for all human life. When asked if he were a prophet, Abdul Baha corrected them. I am not a prophet, he said. I am a servant of God. 
My name is Abdul Baha, the servant of Baha. Despite this, throughout his 239 days stay in this vast country, the newspapers repeatedly refer to the master as the prophet of God and the messenger of peace. His stay was extended far longer than initially planned. He visited communities from the East Coast to the Midwest, delivering talks to large audiences in churches, synagogues, societies, and also in individuals' homes, all along his train journey to California. The Master's first public talk took place on Sunday, April the 14th, at the Church of the Ascension on Fifth Avenue. It was a historic day for the Baha'is of New York City, especially Juliet Thompson, a parishioner of this church where the rector had at one time fiercely denounced Abdu'l-Baha. Instead of the traditional lesson for the day, the service opened with the reading of Corinthians chapter 13 and the prophecies about the return of Christ. Abdu'l-Baha was waiting in the vestry when the organ music began to thunder and the triumphant words, Jesus lives, rang out. He walked up the nave with kingly strides. Dr. Percy Grant, the church rector, led him by the hand all the way up to the bishop's chair. Before a throng of 2,000, Dr. Grant introduced the master with the greatest respect, concluding with an emotional request that Abdu'l-Baha give the benediction. With his face uplifted, his eyes closed, and his palms raised in supplication, Abdu'l-Baha chanted a prayer in Persian, with the clergyman leaning on each side of him. It was, according to Juliet, too great to be put into words. It was almost too great to bear. After the service, the master went out to his car in the company of the believers, while the whole neighborhood resounded with the cries of Allahu Akbar. There were certain extraordinary events which took place over the course of the master's journeys across America and Canada, which, in retrospect, seem to have acquired an even greater relevance not only for the United States, but for the whole world. One concerned the issue of racial unity. Abdu'l-Baha was very forthright on this subject. He considered it the most pressing issue and most important challenge facing America. And his words had a direct impact on individuals. A young Englishwoman in the group, Louisa Matthews, had met a black American lawyer called Louis Gregory during her visit to Abdu'l-Baha in Egypt. It was now the master's ardent hope that these two should be wed, and his hope was fulfilled when their wedding took place in New York City soon after his arrival that September. Their union at such a time and in such a segregated nation was a powerful symbol of racial harmony and demonstrated publicly the Baha'i principle in this regard. The master relished mixed gatherings of black and white people, as can be heard from his remarks delivered at Howard University in Washington, D.C. on the 23rd of April. Today I am most happy, for I see here a gathering of the servants of God. I see white and black sitting together. There are no whites and blacks before God. All colors are one, and that is the color of servitude to God. His encouragement led to the Race Amity Conference hosted by the Baha'is of Washington, D.C., which took place in May 1921, and where a message from the Master was read aloud. Furthermore, his words were put into action at a prestigious gathering while in the nation's capital, and this led to his being featured as one of the Men of the Month in an issue of the crisis a publication of the NAACP. Howard University still commemorates his visit in annual events on its campus. According to the newspapers, ex-president Theodore Roosevelt was apparently wonderfully impressed with the teachings of Abdu'l-Bahá, the Persian teacher of a universal religion liberated from prison 
and expected in this country in May. He had declared in an article which had appeared in 1912, just prior to the Master's arrival in America, that Abdul Baha's teachings would encourage world peace. And so Abdul Baha met him while in Washington, D.C. He was also invited to the White House by President Taft at a time when the country was preparing for a federal election. But a last minute invitation to him from the House Speaker to address US Congress on the 29th of April was graciously declined as he was traveling to Chicago by train that same evening. He had been invited to speak at the fourth annual NAACP conference and once again urged the theme of race amity to an audience of several thousand, getting wide press coverage. Abdul Baha's historic trip to the West was focused on the oneness of mankind and the urgency of racial equality. A few years after his American voyage, Abdul Baha said of the issue of racism, If the races do not come to an agreement, there can be no question or doubt of bloodshed. When I was in America, I told the white and colored people that it was incumbent upon them to be united or else there would be the shedding of blood. I did not say more than this, that they might not be saddened, but indeed there is a greater danger than only the shedding of blood. It is the destruction of America. Because aside from the racial prejudice, there is another agitating factor. It is that of America's enemies. These enemies are agitating both sides. That is, they are stirring up the white race against the colored race and the colored race against the white race. But of this, the Americans are submerged in the sea of ignorance. Two other extraordinary events in the course of the Master's visit in America proved in the long term to be of global significance. One occurred on May the 1st while he was in Chicago, where he also attended the last session of the newly founded Baha'i Temple Unity. The second took place about six weeks later in New York. May the 1st was a very special day for the American Baha'is. They had been preparing for it for a long time. Land had been purchased on the shores of Lake Michigan and a large tent had been raised in anticipation of the Master's visit. It was here during the course of a historic ceremony that Abdul Baha laid the foundation stone of the Mother Temple of the West at Wilmette. After inspecting the grounds and speaking to the gathering of friends, a small ceremonial golden trowel was handed to the Master. But it proved insufficient and impractical in his opinion. The master insisted on digging a real hole, so a shovel was brought instead, and he invited the delegates of various American communities to follow his example and dig. Finally, a large rock, contributed by Mrs. Nettie Tobin, was placed as a foundation stone in the hole they had dug together. Afterwards, as the master packed the earth around it, on behalf of all the people of the world, he joyously declared, the temple is already built. This building, which Abdul Baha had envisioned as the silent teacher and which was designed by the French-Canadian architect Louis Bourgeois, became an inspiration for the Baha'is around the world. The design was completed in 1920 before the Master's passing. The second significant event, unlike the laying of the cornerstone in Chicago, had not been anticipated by the Baha'is in the States. No one was prepared for it. But what occurred on June the 19th, 1912, proved to be a historic day, not only for New York, but for the worldwide Baha'i community. The artist, Juliet Thompson, had been called to work on his portrait on that day. She was given three sittings by the master. I had just begun to work. Lua Getzinger in the room, sitting on a couch nearby, when the master smiled at me, then, turning to Lua, said in Persian, I appoint you, Lua, the herald of the covenant, and I am the covenant appointed by Baha'u'llah. Go forth and proclaim, this is the covenant of God in your midst. So it was that Abdul Baha named New York the City of the Covenant that day. He also spoke to the friends of the Tablet of the Branch revealed by Baha'u'llah in Adrianople and proclaimed his own station as the Centre of the Covenant. 
Eighty years later, in 1992, the Second Baha'i World Congress was celebrated in the City of the Covenant, and the visit of the Master was commemorated there. Another important event took place in August 1912, which has inspired Baha'is all over the world ever since. It was the week that Abdul Baha spent in Elliot, Maine. This idyllic spot was owned by Sarah Farmer, whose family were transcendentalists and associated with the abolitionists and other progressive movements of the times. She had conceived this as a place where minds, souls and bodies could be refreshed. Following the Parliament of Religions in Chicago, 1893, she had had the idea of launching a place for the comparative study of religions and had formally opened Greenacre in 1894 by raising the world's first peace flag here. Miss Farmer had travelled to Acre to meet Abdu'l-Bahá in 1899 and had been so inspired that on her return she pursued her dream with renewed vigour. Thus it was that the first Baha'i summer school was instituted in Greenacre in 1900, an event which would be mirrored and multiplied all over the world in the decades that followed. Many influential writers, inventors and thinkers were drawn to Greenacre in those early years, including John Greenleaf Whittier and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Mirza Abul Fazl was one of the first Baha'is to offer lectures on the faith there in the early 1900s. The master saw Greenacre as a future institution of spiritual and material learning. Many gathered at the 50-room inn overlooking the river to hear him speak and to pay special tribute to Sarah Farmer for her achievements and vision. Another significant episode in the course of Abdul Baha's visit took place on the West Coast, and this event too proved of profound importance for humanity. Dr. David Starr Jordan, the president of Stanford University, was one of the original trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and invited Abdul Baha to give a special address at the college on the 8th of October. A crowded assembly hall awaited with eager expectation his appearance that day. It was as though Abdul Baha had his finger on the pulse of his listeners. He set out to establish a scientific foundation for peace for this educated audience, using the atomic model in physics for his argument. From the fellowship and co-mingling of the elemental atoms, life results. In their harmony and blending, there is ever newness of existence. It is radiance, completeness, it is consummation, it is life itself. If the animals are savage and ferocious, it is simply a means for their subsistence and preservation. They are deprived of that degree of intellect which can reason and discriminate between right and wrong, justice and injustice. On the other hand, humankind possessed a unique capacity for abstract thought. When man is ferocious and cruel toward his fellow man, it is not for subsistence or safety. His motive is selfish advancement and willful wrong. From every real standpoint, there must and should be peace among all nations, he urged, and then attacked the delusions that led to war, 
and the tyrants who promoted these. Torrents of precious blood are spilled in defense of these imaginary divisions, he said, under the delusion of a fancied and limited patriotism. These boundary lines and artificial barriers have been created by despots and conquerors who sought to attain dominion over mankind, thereby engendering patriotic feeling and rousing selfish devotion to merely local standards of government. As a rule, they themselves enjoyed luxuries in palaces surrounded by conditions of ease and affluence, while armies of soldiers, civilians, and tillers of the soil fought and died at their command upon the field of battle, shedding their innocent blood for a delusion such as, we are Germans, our enemies are French, etc. When in reality, all are humankind, all belong to the one family and posterity of Adam. We live upon this earth for a few days and then rest beneath it forever, Abdul Baha declared, his voice rising to a climax. Shall man fight for the tomb which devours him? What ignorance could be greater than this? To fight over his grave? To kill another for his grave? What heedlessness, what a delusion. As Abdul Baha's piercing gaze swept over the young men in the assembly hall, could he see how many of them would soon sink in the muddy fields of World War I? How many would die under a hail of bullets and in clouds of poison gas? It is my hope, he concluded, that you who are students in this university may never be called upon to fight for the dust of earth which is the tomb and sepulchre of all mankind. The audience was overcome with emotion and applause shook the building to its very foundation, according to Mahmoud, who recorded the event in his diary. When the master left the hall accompanied by his interpreters, Many stood by in awe, shaken by what they had just heard and witnessed. His predictions of the Great War were so ominous that one newspaper article referred to Abdul Baha as having claimed that we are on the eve of the Battle of Armageddon, referred to in the 16th chapter of Revelation. The time is two years hence, when only a small spark will set aflame the whole of Europe. President Jordan had invited him to lunch at his own home after the talk and was later asked for his impressions of Abdul Baha. He will surely unite the East and the West, for he walks the mystical way with practical feet, he replied. The Palo Alto newspaper concluded, Those who pray for the coming of the kingdom of God on earth may see in Abbas Effendi one who dwells in that kingdom consciously and creates an environment pulsating with the peace that passeth ordinary understanding. His last stop before the long journey back across the United States was a talk in Sacramento, where he again warned his audience of the inevitability of war though he also affirmed, may the first flag of international peace be raised in this state. By a strange twist of divine irony, it was indeed in San Francisco in 1945 that the United Nations Charter was signed and the flag of this international body was first hoisted. Abdul Baha's journeys in the United States and Canada drew massive media attention. He was in the headlines from the first day he arrived and virtually every time he spoke and everywhere he visited. And in this regard too, his words about the press reverberate down the decades to us today with a particular significance. Abdul Baha expressed himself candidly on the subject. Newspapers are the mirrors that reflect the progression of the community, he said. 
we may ascertain the progress or retrogression of a nation by its journalism. If journalists should abide by their duties, they would be the promoters of many virtues among the community. But his praise was tempered with caution. Journalists must serve the truth, he said. Newspapers must publish significant articles that shall foster the public welfare. If they do so, they will be the highest promoters for the development of the community. His visit to Montreal was particularly well covered by the Canadian press. 34 articles were published in 10 of the 12 daily newspapers during his brief stay. Abdu'l-Bahá's keen insight into contemporary issues captured the headlines. He repeatedly urged that the material achievements of the West should be balanced by spiritual advancement for true civilization to be attained, otherwise it would lead to destruction. He was acutely concerned about the Balkans and predicted that a regional war there could envelop the world and lead to large-scale destruction. He addressed many of the other topics of the day when he was interviewed. He said workers should not only receive their wages but a share of the profits as well to create a just distribution of wealth. He urged capitalists to be moderate and to bear in mind the welfare of the poor and needy. If a part suffered, it would be detrimental to the whole. Thus, legislation was needed to prevent abuse. However, on the subject of equal pay, the master stated that wages would invariably have to be unequal, simply because people were not of equal ability and should be paid according to their varying capacities. One main aim of the master's visit to Montreal was to greet the Baha'i friends and to be with the Maxwell family who lived there. May Bowles had been married to Sutherland Maxwell, a renowned Canadian architect, who insisted the master stay with them during his visit. He did so for three days, after which he moved to Hotel Windsor. The master stayed in this room on the upper floor of their home on Pine Avenue. After 23 days in California, and a three-week journey by train across the United States with five city stops along the way, Abdu'l-Bahá finally returned to New York on the 11th of November. He was often recognized by passengers because of the widespread publicity generated during his travels. He was approached by many admirers for counsel and friendship. His final talk before he set sail for Liverpool took place on the morning of the 5th of December when more than a hundred people boarded the RMS Celtic to bid him farewell. As Abdu'l-Bahá spoke in his deep, resonant Persian, many wept at his words. The earth is one native land, one home, and all mankind are the children of one father. God has created them, and they are the recipients of his compassion. It is the wish of our Heavenly Father that we should live together in felicity and joy. The obstacle to human happiness is racial or religious prejudice, the competitive struggle for existence and inhumanity towards each other. Until man reaches this high station, Abdu'l-Bahá said, the world of humanity shall not find rest, and eternal felicity shall not be attained. But if man lives up to these divine commandments, this world of earth shall be transformed into the world of heaven, and this material sphere shall be converted into a paradise of glory. It was finally time to say goodbye and disembark. Abdu'l-Bahá walked out along the deck of the ship. He leaned on the railing and looked down at the crowd gazing up at him. As the clock struck noon, the great ocean liner began to pull slowly away from the pier. But the people fixed their eyes on Abdu'l-Bahá's white turban for as long as it was visible, as the ship set out for the flowing waters of the Hudson and sailed into the open sea. It is more than two years that I have been far from the holy shrine of Baha'u'llah, the master told the friends while he was in California. Now he was returning home at last, even as the heavy clouds of World War I were gathering.
Abdul Baha's voyage from New York to Liverpool took eight days. The White Star liner, RMS Celtic, reached the port on a cloudy evening on the 13th of December, escorted in her final approach by a crowd of noisy tugboats hooting through the fog. Hippolyte Dreyfus Barney had come from Paris to welcome Abdul Baha back to Europe. He and a group of friends from Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds watched as the great ship emerged slowly out of the dark night. Monsieur Dreyfus went up on deck. The master embraced him as newspaper men began to cluster round. They bombarded Abdul Baha with questions about his trip to America. His replies appeared in the next day's papers. Before he disembarked, the captain expressed his pleasure and his honor at hosting the master on this voyage on behalf of all the crew, the maids, and the other passengers. One of the maids confessed that she had never met any passenger before who had been as kind and as generous to all of them as the master had been. Surrounded by expressions of joy and gratitude, the master left with Dreyfus and Mahmoud Zaghani for the newly inaugurated Adelphi Hotel, where he would stay for three days. Back from the new world to the old one, the master accepted an invitation to speak to the Theosophical Society of the city. Afterwards, he expressed his pleasure at his reception in Liverpool. But all the while, he was keenly following the peace negotiations taking place in London. For the ambassadors of the great powers had gathered at the capital to consult about the Balkans where the storm clouds were gathering and war was imminent. As soon as he returned to London by train, the master began to receive a constant stream of visitors. They came to 97 Cadogan Gardens, the home of Lady Blomfield, where he had stayed on his prior trip to the capital. One of the most prominent was Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst, leader of the suffragette movement, which had been calling women to be given the vote for several decades. Given the reluctance to accept change and the inveterate traditionalism of the British establishment, the tactics to which this movement had been driven were by now quite radical. The suffragettes had taken to blocking public roads, disrupting traffic and handcuffing themselves to the rails of the Parliament buildings in order to draw attention to their cause. Mrs Pankhurst was very pleased with her interview with the Master because although he counselled against violent tactics, he encouraged Emmeline to continue the work of her movement. Women, he assured her, would shortly take their rightful place in the world. Abdu'l-Bahá elaborated on the relationship between men and women by using the metaphor of two wings. If humanity was to soar ever higher, he told her, we need both wings to be equally strong. Then he added whimsically, what if I prove that woman is the stronger wing? You will earn my eternal gratitude, she replied. Earlier in America, in response to a reporter who had asked for his opinion of the suffragist movement, the master had said, In fact, women have a superior disposition to men. They are more receptive, more sensitive, and their intuition more intense. When Emmeline wanted to know if Abdul Baha considered himself a prophet, he responded with modest irony. No, I am a man just like you. Another prominent figure who came several times to see the master in Cadogan Gardens was Edward Granville Brown, the famous Orientalist. He noticed how happy Abdul Baha was and how joyous since the last time they had met 22 years before in Akka. On the 26th of December, 1912, he was asked, what is the purpose of our lives? Abdul Baha responded, to acquire virtues, and then proceeded to explain the evolution of life from the mineral to the vegetable to the animal kingdom and ultimately the world of humanity, which is uniquely gifted with reason, the power of invention and spiritual insight. Abdul Baha also travelled to Oxford to speak at Manchester College. On his way, he stopped at the home of the famed theologian Dr. T.K. Cheney at his invitation. 
Professor Cheney was ill at the time, and Lady Blomfield, who was accompanying the master, described how Abdul Baha took this man and his angelic wife into his loving embrace. The meeting was so moving that the master's eyes were filled with tears. Many others also wept. It was, according to Lady Blomfield, too intimate to describe. Dr. T. K. Cheney would embrace the Baha'i faith that same year. The master arrived in Edinburgh on the 6th of January 1913. His visit in the dead of winter only lasted four days, but each day was packed with activities. He stayed at the home of Mr. and Dr. Alexander White, the moderator of the General Assembly Free Church of Scotland and the principal of the Divinity Faculty of Edinburgh University. Their home at 7 Charlotte Square is now owned and preserved by the National Trust of Scotland for public view. Back in London after a brief passage through Bristol, the master prepared for his return to France, leaving Victoria train station for Paris on the 21st of January. Lady Blomfield was among the large crowd of well-wishers, recounting that we stood bereft of his presence as he spoke courteous words of farewell with that love-laden smile. During the master's nine-week stay in Paris, men and women of all backgrounds were to meet and be inspired by his peerless personality. After travelling to Stuttgart, Budapest and Vienna, he returned to Paris before sailing on the SS Himalaya from Marseille to Port Said. He remained for a prolonged stay in Ramla, Egypt, and then at long last returned to Haifa. His historic journeys were concluded on December the 5th, 1913. He had only been back in Haifa for six months when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, successor to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated. As he had so often warned during his travels, it only took a single spark to set off the powder keg that was Europe. The First World War had begun. It was an uncertain time for the world. It was also an anxious time for the Baha'i community. Haifa was under constant threat of bombardment. The Ottomans were opposed to the Western Allies and Russia and aligned with the Central Powers in Germany. This created great tensions for British interests in the region. With the war in progress and trade impeded, Abdul Baha realized that there would not be enough to feed the population of Palestine. Well before his visit to the West, he had bought various plots of land near the city of Tiberias and in the Jordan Valley and instructed the Baha'is to grow grain and other crops in this fertile region. He taught them to store their harvests in pits used by the Romans centuries before, which not only kept the grain fresh but also protected it from theft. Many souls were able to survive the war through the prescience of the master and this stock of precious grain. Major Wellesley Tudor Pole, who had already met Abdul Baha in Egypt and London, was serving in the Directorate of Military Intelligence in the Middle East during the course of the war. In 1918, he received news that Abdul Baha was in great danger. Jamal Pasha, one of the most powerful men in the Turkish Empire, instigated by Muhammad Ali, Abdul Baha's half-brother, had designs on Abdul Baha's life. This matter also brought to the attention of Lady Blomfield had caused her to approach British authorities directly. Tudor Pole gave a letter to one of his friends who was going to London. He asked him to deliver it promptly to the British cabinet, which at that time included Lord Lamington, who had known and met Abdul Baha in London too, as well as Lord Curzon, an Orientalist, historian, and keen observer of the Babi and Baha'i persecutions in Persia. As a result, a telegram was immediately sent from the cabinet to Lord Balfour, whose task was to liberate Haifa, and also to General Edmund Allenby in the Holy Land, ordering them to extend every protection to Abdul Baha and his friends. While these people were growing increasingly worried about him, Abdul Baha himself was the essence of calm detachment, reassuring those around him and doing everything possible to alleviate their anguish. 
and although his correspondence with them was disrupted by the hostilities, he was also thinking about his dear friends in other parts of the world. He was communicating with them constantly through his prayers, as well as through the uncertain postal service, urging them over and over again to teach the cause, to carry on his work. In the course of those fateful years of World War I, Abdul Baha drafted 14 letters which came to be known as the Tablets of the Divine Plan. These immortal missives were addressed to the Baha'is of the United States and Canada, and in them, Abdul Baha reminded the friends of Christ's exhortation to his disciples to travel to every corner of the world in order to spread his message. Now, the Baha'is of North America were being given the same mission. The Tablets of the Divine Plan were the Master's historic legacy to humanity. They were the pattern for all future plans to be launched by Shoghi Effendi, the beloved guardian of the faith, and thereafter by the supreme elected body, the Universal House of Justice. Following their receipt, many Baha'is packed their bags, left their homes, and went out to establish the faith in the four corners of the world. In vivid contrast to the breaking down of the old order unleashed by the war, Abdul Baha's tablets created a blueprint for the establishment of the new world order of Baha'u'llah. The Battle of Megiddo in September 1918 proved to be the climactic battle of the Sinai and Palestine campaign of the First World War. German and Ottoman forces found themselves encircled by the Allied armies of the British and French under the command of General Allenby. This battle effectively marked the end of World War I in the Middle East, as well as the centuries-old Turkish domination over the Holy Land. The Ottoman Empire would be split apart with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. In recognition of his services to the inhabitants of Palestine during the war, Abdul Baha was made an honorary knight of the British Empire. The British government had not forgotten that during the famine of the war years, the foresight of Abdul Baha had provided enough wheat to feed not only the people of Palestine, but British soldiers as well. An automobile was provided for him to attend the ceremony of the investiture, but he preferred to use a horse-drawn carriage instead, driven by his faithful and beloved servant Isfandiyar. While he accepted the knighthood and participated in the ceremony that was officiated by Field Marshal Allenby acting as the official representative of the British Empire, Abdul Baha never used the title Sir Abdul Baha Abbas, always preferring the simple Abdul Baha, Servant of Baha. In spite of his advanced age, Abdul Baha continued to maintain his grueling schedule. He kept up with his ever increasing correspondence, his visits from officials, his charitable works for the poor. He accepted the request to act as president of a society in Haifa for the purpose of improving conditions in the city and surrounding area. He was a source of comfort to many and an inspiration to all. In addition to his Tablets of the Divine Plan, Abdul Baha's lasting legacy to the world was his covenant, as enshrined in his will and testament. While he had already articulated the significance of the covenant during his travels in America, it was his will and testament, which was a de facto interpretation of Baha'u'llah's Book of the Covenant and his Kitabi Akdas, which confirmed its continuation through the ministries of his grandson Shoghi Effendi and a duly elected Universal House of Justice. These twin inheritors of his will would successively provide the worldwide Baha'i community with guidance, direction, and unity for the rest of the dispensation. One evening in 1921, Abdul Baha turned to his gardener, who had just finished his day's work, and said, I also have finished my work. I can do nothing more. Therefore, I must leave it and take my departure. In the morning of November 27th, Abdul Baha took tea as usual with his family. In the afternoon, there was a celebration at the Shrine of the Bab in honor of the Day of the Covenant. Abdul Baha sent his family to attend it, for he himself could no longer do so. In the evening, he inquired after the health of everyone in the household, the pilgrims and the friends in Haifa. Very good, very good, he said when he heard that no one was ill. At eight o'clock, he went to bed. He told his family, I am quite well, and urged them all to take their rest. Two of his daughters stayed up with him. It was an hour and a half after midnight 
on Monday, 28th of November, 1921, when he passed away. His daughter, Ruha, thought he was asleep, but his spirit had flown to its eternal home. The next day, Palestine witnessed an outpouring of grief that had never been seen before. More than 10,000 souls spontaneously gathered to mourn the loss of the one they venerated and to accompany his casket to its final resting place on Mount Carmel. Each of them had been touched by this unique being. Many owed their very lives to him for the grain he had stored to save them from starvation during the war years. Others owed their well-being to his generosity, care and support over the decades. Still others had depended on the spiritual joy and the deep hope and happiness that he had brought into their lives. The governor of Jerusalem confessed, I have never known a more united expression of regret and respect than was called forth by the utter simplicity of the ceremony. High and low bowed their heads to him, united in sorrow and in common grief. Despite the differences that existed between some, despite the fractious tensions and petty jealousies that divided others, their devotion towards the Master had brought together an assembly of mourners from every faith, race, background and class. The funeral of Abdu'l-Bahá was a veritable feast of love in the honour of the mystery of God. Abdu'l-Bahá's own words of love remained ringing in many ears on that occasion. The most great, peerless gift of God to the world of humanity is happiness born of love. The year 2021 marked the centenary of the passing of the master, Abdu'l-Bahá. In his honour, a special shrine was being built between the cities of Haifa and Acre, where he spent most of his life. The design of this magnificent mausoleum approved by the Universal House of Justice is a reflection of the master's selflessness, his deep humility, and his yearning to serve God's creatures. It embodies his embrace of all of humanity, regardless of creed, race, nationality, or persuasion. Abdu'l-Bahá perfectly exemplifies a life consecrated to others. It was a young and happy life at first, that was turned upside down at the age of six with the imprisonment of his father in the notorious Black Pit of Tehran. It was a life of banishment and confinement and hostility for the next 70 years, a life filled with tension and turmoil, danger and threat, until his very last breath on earth. Despite continuing challenges from all sides, this servant of Baha never lost hope. His life will be cherished for generations to come as a shining portrayal of what it means to be a perfect human. His was a saintly life. May the story of his life inspire and motivate us to spread happiness and joy and to strive to think and act for the welfare of all humanity and our home, the planet Earth. Abdu'l-Bahá's journeys constitute a unique event in the history of humankind. Never before and at no time since 
has such a personage of such spiritual stature, himself carried the pure beams of the revelation from the east to the west. Over the course of his travels between 1911 to 1913, the master touched many hearts and transformed many lives. These stories offer a brief sampling of his legacy. After leaving the Holy Land in 1911 and passing through Egypt en route to Europe, Abdul Baha boarded a ship bound for Marseille, France, and made his way north to Tonon les Bains. Here he took up residence at the Grand Hotel du Parc in this thermal spa on the shores of Lac Le Mans. Laura Barney had not seen him for several years since their table talks in Acre, which had led to the famous compilation Some Answered Questions. Since then, she had married the Frenchman Hippolyte Dreyfus, and one beautiful sunny day in August, soon after his arrival, the Dreyfus-Barney couple met Abdul Baha in Tonon. Meanwhile, another believer, the artist Juliette Thompson, had been waiting in London for permission to join the master too. She also travelled to Tonon. Now once again in the presence of her heart's king and her soul's beloved, she felt her own insignificance keenly and found herself abashed before him. Are you happy, Juliet? he asked one day, noting her discomfiture. Are you happy to be here? How many years since you were in Acre? A lifetime, she responded, and covered her face with her hands before his majesty. At Hotel du Parc, Abdul Baha also encountered one of his compatriots, the Persian prince Masoud Mirza Zellus Sultan, the eldest son of Nasreddin Shah. As the governor of several provinces in Iran, he had persecuted the Baha'is zealously and was responsible for the execution of the innocent king of martyrs and the beloved of martyrs in 1879 as well as at least 100 other Baha'is. Having encountered Hippolyte Dreyfus in Persia some years earlier, Zellus Sultan met him again and begged to be allowed into the presence of the master. He was pacing the terrace of the hotel when they found him. And at the sight of him, Zellus Sultan began to murmur miserable excuses for the atrocities he had committed. But as they approached, the master turned to greet the prince with open arms. To Hippolyte's astonishment, he embraced him, saying, All those things are in the past. Never think of them again. What a lesson in forgiveness, Dreyfus thought. A few days later, Juliet was full of excitement. We did the most amazing thing, she cried. The master, Laura, Hippolyte and I went for an automobile ride. Did you ever think, Juliet, said the master, laughing as we got into the car with him, that you and Laura would be riding in an automobile with me in Europe? The countryside around the thermal baths of tonon les bains was very picturesque. Hippolyte had told him of the Devil's Bridge far down in the forest, a place celebrated for its beauty, and the master wanted to see it. In the Middle Ages, villagers who tried to cross the precarious path slipped and fell and were said to have been seized by the devil. The master was so impressed with the freshness of the grass and fields and the lushness of the hills that he wrote to Monir Echonum, from the day I left Iran until now, I had not seen such a place. On their return, they came upon a spectacular waterfall. To their terror and wonderment, the master was so excited and moved by the sight of it that he walked to the very edge of the precipice. Laura and Juliet watched their lord with tears of wonder and awe. Abdul Baha was recognized as a celebrity from the moment of his arrival at Victoria Station in London, which he had traveled to by ferry from France. His stay in this famous capital of the West caused much excitement, and many independent photographers jostled about trying to take pictures of him whenever he was in public view. Lady Blomfield, in whose home in this high-class neighborhood Abdul Baha was a guest during his stay, finally approached one of these image hunters. 
Do you think this is courteous to be continuously hounding a respectable personage, she asked, with some hauteur? No, madam, was the reply, but if others succeed and I fail, my chief will think me a fool. When Abdul Baha heard of this exchange, he laughed heartily. If the photographs must be taken, it would be better to have good ones, he said, and then consented for a formal sitting at a photographer's. Many wished to visit the master at 97 Cadogan Gardens. Amongst them were ambassadors, maharajas, politicians, theosophists and religious leaders. His day began in the early hours and he breakfasted around half past six, having already seen many visitors by then. Given the high demand to see him, appointments had to be made ahead of time. One day a woman rang the doorbell to see the master without a prior appointment and was denied a meeting. As she left, the master heard of it and asked Lady Blomfield to rush outside to bring her back as a heart has been broken. In weeks that followed, the master delivered public talks to several congregations and met a wide variety of audiences. The Lord Mayor of London welcomed him to the Mansion House, where discussion focused on the social conditions of great cities. The master even found time to visit a seriously ill writer at an East End hospital, as described by Lady Blomfield in her book, The Chosen Highway. Many sought for an audience with the master in Paris, too. A materialist philosopher and celebrity in his own right, Henri Bergson, came one day together with a group of his pupils to meet the master in this charming residence in Paris, furnished by Monsieur et Madame Dreyfus Barney. He wanted to question the master about the existence of a creator. The master spoke of the differences of opinion between those who believe that nature governs the universe and those who believe in God. Bergson asked whether Abdu'l-Bahá thought the two points of view could be reconciled. Since he was known to be partial to metaphors, the master provided him with one. Suppose, he said, you take a handful of salt and throw it in a sweet water lake. Can you say the water has no salt in it, even though it does not taste salty? After some reflection, Bergson admitted that the presence of salt could not be denied. Abdu'l-Bahá then compared salt in the water to intelligent design. Bergson was so impressed by the master's analogy that he thumped the table with his hand and left the meeting. After disembarking from the ocean liner Cedric on the 11th of April 1912, the master was driven to the Hotel Ansonia on the corner of Broadway and 73rd Street in New York. It was one of the most modern hotels of its day, famed for the luxury of air conditioning. That same afternoon, he attended a gathering of all his devoted followers at the Kinney home. The house was thronged with visitors. There were so many that they could hardly avoid treading on each other's toes. Everyone who was able to come was there, nudging elbows and jostling each other aside to catch a view of the master. Certain friends of the Baha'is had also come, and one was the Unitarian minister, Howard Colby Ives, who had been invited by Mountford Mills. He had agreed to attend the gathering with some reluctance at first, but now, after a mere glimpse of the master, he longed to see him alone and without interpreters. So the next morning, driven by this irrational hope, he returned to the Ansonia. Crowds had already begun gathering there to see the master, and Ives had made no appointment. But to his immense surprise when the master appeared among them, he found himself motioned to follow him they walked single file into a room, and once there, without any interpreters, and with his heart's longings mysteriously fulfilled, Howard was moved to tears. He was so overwhelmed by the master's presence that he left the hotel still weeping. His life was never quite the same again, as he wrote in his book, Portals to Freedom. It was a longing of Abdu'l-Bahá to visit the poor and homeless in New York and so it was arranged for him to visit the Bowery. A journalist and illustrator by the pen name of Kate Carew accompanied the master on this visit. She had come to interview Abdu'l-Bahá at the Ansonia Hotel and was surprised that a prisoner and spiritual leader would stay in such an opulent place. Does the attention paid in this country to material things sadden you? she asked. Does it argue to you a lack of progress? 
the master responded, Your material civilization is very wonderful. If only you will allow divine idealism to keep pace with it, there is great hope for general progress. Kate Carew had many more questions to ask, but the master was keen to go to the Bowery. I love them, he explained simply, regarding the poor he was going to meet. And once the interview was at an end, he took Kate by the hand and proceeded with her to the shelter. I consider you my relatives, my companions, he told the people there, and I am your comrade. You must be thankful to God that you are poor, for His Holiness Jesus Christ has said, Blessed are the poor. He never said, Blessed are the rich. Jesus Himself was poor. He also told the homeless tramps how Baha'u'llah lived among the poor for two years, how he ate with them, slept with them, and felt it an honor to be one of them. Abdul Baha's message went far beyond words. He had asked two of the Baha'is to take $200 of his own funds and exchange it for small coins. When he finished speaking, he took his place by the door with the two believers beside him, holding their bags of cash. As he shook the hands of approximately 500 impoverished souls that evening, he slipped one or two quarters into each of their palms, just enough for a night's lodging. Kate Carew was profoundly impressed. Her brief interview produced the lead article on the front page of the New York Tribune. That demonstration of Abdul Baha's creed, she wrote, did more to convince me of the absolute sincerity of the man than anything else that had happened. It was done so gracefully, without any fuss or fume. And as I went out into the starlit night, I murmured the phrase of an Oriental admirer who had described him as the breeze of God. An incident that exemplified Abdul Baha's commitment to racial equality happened while in Washington, D.C. He had been invited by Ali Kuli Khan, the chargé d'affaires of the Persian legation, to attend a luncheon in his honour. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, and Admiral Peary, fresh from his conquest of the North Pole, were among the dignitaries invited to the reception. Among the Baha'is were the artist Juliet Thompson and Louis Gregory, who'd been invited at the last minute on the personal request of Abdul Baha. When the luncheon was announced and Abdul Baha was leading the invited guests to the dining room to be seated, the master suddenly noticed that Mr. Gregory was not there. Bring Mr. Gregory, he said and while awaiting his arrival, he rearranged the place settings so that Louis Gregory had the seat of honour at his right. When Louis Gregory joined them, Abdul Baha announced how pleased he was to have Mr. Gregory there, and in the most natural way, he proceeded to give a talk on the oneness of mankind. Abdul Baha's visit to Chicago included a gathering in Lincoln Park, where he accepted to have several photographs taken of himself with groups of children and youth. Decades later, in 1987, on the 75th anniversary of his visit there, a few of those same children had something to say about it. And I was so greatly impressed every time I would see him. He paced back and forth on the stage, and he's just, you see such power latent within that person. The, <clears throat> there was a famous American artist who became Baha'i, Mrs. Julia Thompson. She said just to look into those eyes was enough for her. And as he stood back and forth on the stage, you see, can just see and realize the strength and power that is within that body. When he entered, it was a very impressive sight. As small as I was, I could see the radiance or the dignity of this man who was to make such an impression on all our lives. 
As he sat down, of course, I was impressed too by the fact that he was using a chair that was very similar to the chairs that kings are coronated in. And so the whole picture of Abdul Baha sitting there in all his splendor was imprinted on my mind. He called each of the younger children up first and placed them on his lap. He kissed some of them on the forehead. He patted some on the head. I was patted, if I remember, as he pushed his arms around me. And I had a feeling that I would prefer to be on the floor, <laughs> that I wanted to get off his knee. But everybody asks, what did he say to you? Well, he did talk to each one of the children. He asked their names and uh, whispered something to them. Of course, if you see any of the pictures of me, I looked like I was very unhappy. So I kind of think that he said, please be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had the pleasure of sitting on his lap, as they tell me, because I was only just over a year old. So my really, the recollection of his face and feature is not too good. But I think that I had received some of the spirit that he always gave forth. And for that, I feel very gracious and I don't think that uh, is something that I would treasure forever. Abdul Baha sat down, and the rest of us were in the room, of course, but we didn't sit at the table at that time. However, he seemed to devote much of his attention after he had shaked hands with the friends to the children, and uh, uh, children are impressed if, if adults give them the love and Abdul Baha sure could do it. And I just stood there and gazed at him. I'm, I don't remember too much about it, but Mother always tells me. She said that he asked me what I would like, because it was a big, bush, a big dish or a bowl of fruit. And I always liked bananas, so he gave me one. And I treasured that very much. That's a blessing that I hope I will be worthy of as time goes on. My mother wrote to Abu Baha asking him if he would please name me. And uh, my mother belonged to the women's club in the town we lived in. And uh, she got no answer from Abu Baha. And, uh, these women got up in arms, saying, when are you going to name that baby? <laughs> and uh, my mother said, when the name comes from Haifa, I'll name him. <laughs> so they said, no, we'll name him. This happened to be the town of Clyde. We'll name him Clyde. <laughs> so I had the name of Clyde for quite some time until the uh, letter came from Abba, the tablet, I should say, and he said, name thy baby Joseph. The fact of my mother's healing. For over a year, she had a tumor of the breast, and they didn't know in those days whether it was cancer and cancerous or not or anything much about it, but it was a serious condition. When she was in Abdu'l-Ba, when she walked into the room, the light was so bright that she was practically dazed. She couldn't, she was, as she described it, she had an, had an other world feeling. She didn't feel it. She was even there. The brightness bothered her dreadfully. And she tried to listen to Dr. Zia Baghdadi interpreting what Abdul Baha had said. She didn't understand anything. The tablet had dropped to the floor, and she never thought of the tablet. Then 
<clears throat> when she got up, she passed near Abdul Baha, and he ran his hand down her side, not touching it, but made this motion. And mother was seized with a very great pain. And she prayed that that pain be removed. I've always thought that spiritual healing was easy, just over like that. It was done, it was completed, without perhaps any suffering. But mother said the pain in her was excruciating. But as she passed on out of that room, she never saw that tumor again. One thing we haven't mentioned tonight, and I was so happy when I heard all of you laughing, Abdu'l-Baha said constantly, you must be happy. Be happy, please be happy. It was a great privilege, and I do think that I had the privilege of seeing him in a little different uh, environment from what you do when he was here in the United States. I saw how he lived there in the Holy Land. I saw a few of the problems that surrounded him and what a, uh, how he gave his whole life to serving everybody around there. He was known by everyone in Haifa, as you probably realize. People would even come to him if they were ill and they thought they didn't want to go to the hospital without seeing him first. I remember one day seeing, standing there and he uh, came out from his busy work and greeted this gentleman who was ill and told him if he would go to the hospital, it would be all right. And then the gentleman went to the hospital. And I remember that we thought that was a rather selfish thing on the part of the, of the gentleman. But it shows us that the master, as they always called him, he was not, I'd never heard him called Abdul Baha there. He was called the master but it shows how he truly loved and truly helped bring out in each person their very best and help them to lead a better life and how he was always ready to serve them. He was telling us that the important part of the pilgrimage was praying at the shrine of Baha'u'llah. He was telling us that in that way. He did give me a name. We saw him privately for a little while my mother was uh, disturbed because she felt that she had perhaps asked too much of her husband, who was not a Baha'i, uh, to get the money so that we could take this long trip around. Uh, it was a difficult trip. It took two months to get there. A great many difficulties because the World War I was just over. England had just taken over the Holy Land, and things were not in a settled condition at all. It took visas to get, into, in, to, get, to get into Palestine, as it was then called, and that took time and negotiating, and it, there were strikes on the boat as we went. They didn't want to load the coal on the boat, and we'd wait a few days in, in Italy for that to be settled, and so on. It was a rather difficult, lengthy trip, but it was worth it. And the master assured my mother that all would be well, that we would uh, be all right, that our trip back would be safe, that we would be protected. And he gave me a name, Badie. In May 1912, Abdul Baha was invited to speak at the Lake Mohunk Peace and Arbitration Conference by the organization's president, Albert Smiley. This was one of the primary purposes for which he had come to America. Prominent attendees at Lake Mohunk included the Scottish-American industrialist, Andrew Carnegie, who had begun a correspondence with the master and was to meet him in New York later in November. His book, The Gospel of Wealth, was praised by Abdul Baha, to whom he had sent a copy for his consideration. The master bestowed blessings on this man and in a letter published in the New York Times, called him the lover of humanity and one of the founders of Universal Peace. Back in Lake Mohunk, which was situated some four hours from New York City by train, the master praised the scenic beauty and grandeur of the route through green hills and valleys, past waterfalls and natural springs. Many dignitaries and delegates from all over the world had been invited to attend this historic peace conference. The Reverend Frederick Lynch of the Federal Council of Churches best summarized Abdu'l-Baha's talk 
when he said, the address of the evening was full of this one thing, the unity of mankind. We are in this world one. It was the most remarkable address I have ever listened to. The friends arranged for a film of Abdu'l-Bahá to be made at the home of Mr. and Mrs. McNutt. A multitude of Baha'is and their friends greeted the master, as seen in this historic footage. That June, at Abdu'l-Bahá's behest, a unity feast was held in the grounds of the home of Roy Wilhelm in West Englewood, New Jersey. According to the Chronicles of Mahmud, the friends were ecstatic today since their host was the beloved of the covenant. Their meeting was an assembly of love and amity, and the surroundings were green and verdant with trees in full bloom perfuming the air. There was a pilaf, a very delicious Persian dish that had been prepared for the occasion. Sherbet, a Persian drink and many sweets. 
everyone was happy at the unity of the gathering. The master said, This meeting will be productive of great results. It will be the cause of attracting a new bounty. These meetings will be mentioned in the future, and their results will be everlasting in all the divine worlds. Indeed, a commemoration of this celebratory event has occurred annually ever since. In September 1912, the Master set off from Montreal to continue his visit of the Western States, stopping off briefly in Buffalo to see the Niagara Falls. He then made his way further west through Chicago and Kenosha, Wisconsin, before continuing on to Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, where he attended a number of venues in the Twin Cities. After that, he continued on to Lincoln and Omaha, Nebraska, where he gave a talk, one of many, on the impending war in Europe. He disembarked from the train in Lincoln specifically to see William Jennings Bryan, a progressive orator and Democratic presidential nominee who had visited him in Acre. He had been unable to see the master on a second occasion in Haifa due to the strictures imposed by the Ottoman authorities, but the master had not forgotten this man's faithfulness and stopped at his hometown on his journey west for this purpose. But unfortunately, Brian was out campaigning at the time for Woodrow Wilson, whom he would serve as Secretary of State in the next administration. Nonetheless, Abdu'l-Bahá extended his greetings to Mrs. Brian, showering his love on the family before heading back to the station. He took the night train to Denver and Glenwood Springs, Colorado, to Salt Lake City, Utah, and finally San Francisco, California. Abdu'l-Bahá made the journey to California primarily to meet the Baha'i friends there. One of them, Thornton Chase, had sadly passed away just prior to the Master's arrival in October 1912. Abdu'l-Bahá considered Thornton Chase as the first American Baha'i and paid special homage to the man, visiting his grave in Los Angeles, where he lovingly arranged flowers, bowed low and kissed the gravestone. Altogether, he spent 23 days in California, most of this time spent at the home of Mrs. Helen Goodall, a devoted Baha'i. While here, the Master had many opportunities to meet the friends, and in particular to enjoy the company of the children who flocked to take pictures with him. Years later, in 1916, Helen Goodall received a postcard from the Master, on which he had inscribed by hand the whole of the tablet of the divine plan addressed to the western states. In his signature seen below, we see his distinctive use of a small A for his own name, followed by a capital B for Baha, symbolizing once again his servitude to his Lord. Another transformative event in the San Francisco area was when Abdu'l-Bahá gave a talk at the Temple Emmanuel Synagogue. The 2,000 Jews present had filled every available seat. The place was packed as the Master spoke about Jesus and Mohammed as both prophets of God. He spoke with such authority and conviction that no one contradicted him. His listeners were left greatly impressed. At the invitation of Phoebe Hurst, Abdu'l-Bahá also spent two days at her hacienda in Pleasanton, California, where guests from high society had been invited to meet him. He had last seen her some 13 years earlier in Acre on that historic visit when she had come on pilgrimage to visit him with 15 others. He much enjoyed his visit in Pleasanton and took the opportunity in this opulent setting and among these influential people to share his thoughts on the upcoming presidential elections, which were now less than a month away. The president must be a man that does not insistently seek the presidency, he said. He should be a person free from all thoughts of name and rank. He must be a well-wisher of all and not a self-seeking person. Before his departure from the hacienda, Abdu'l-Bahá asked for all the servants to be summoned. 
Robert Turner, the first African-American Baha'i, who had served Phoebe Hurst as a butler on the first historic trip to Acre, had by then passed away. But Abdul Baha thanked the rest individually and gave each a generous gift. The master had maintained a correspondence with Andrew Carnegie and visited his home, having great admiration for his philanthropic causes, including endowments for international peace. An industrialist turned philanthropist, Carnegie gave away 90% of his wealth before he died in 1919, funding some 3,000 libraries in the US alone and scores of other charitable activities, which included the Peace Palace in The Hague, which now houses the UN International Court of Justice. The other titan of America was J. Pierpont Morgan, perhaps the wealthiest man in America and the world. The master visited his library on the 18th of November and described his visit in the following manner. The well-known Morgan, who owned a sum of 300 million and was day and night restless and agitated, did not partake of the divine bestowals, save a little broth. He invited me to visit his library and to have dinner. I went to the library in order to look at the Oriental books. In short, he eagerly desired that I should visit him, but meanwhile, important financial problems arose, which prevented him from being present. Now, had he not such an excessive amount of wealth, he might have been able to present himself. This wealth was for him a vicissitude and not the cause of comfort. That said, the master wrote a loving prayer for Morgan in his visitor's book, ending with a supplication that God confirm him in the oneness of the world of humanity and submerge him in the sea of thy favours. On November the 23rd, 1912, the Day of the Covenant was celebrated with a splendid banquet at the Great Northern Hotel in New York. Indeed, the principal purpose of Abdul Baha's journey to America was to officially proclaim his station as the centre of the Covenant, to rally the unity of the Baha'i community around that covenant and to establish the strong foundation of love and integrity upon which the future of the faith of Baha'u'llah would stand and progress. With this in mind, he had designated New York to be the city of the covenant. This magnificent banquet was attended by more than 300 Baha'is. At the head table sat the master with a few notables and behind them was the flag of the United States and Persia. Before the food was served, Abdul Baha went amongst the attendees, anointing everyone with an attar of rose, a Persian custom to honor guests. This was a most moving scene, unforgettable for all who were present. The master then gave a short talk. As the great Northern Hotel manager, had stubbornly refused to allow black guests to attend, the friends organized a great interracial feast at the home of the Kinneys the following night. And here, the white American ladies served their black Baha'i friends with their own hands, a symbolic gesture which brought immense joy to the heart of the master. When he finally departed the shores of North America, it marked the end of this spiritual privilege. He left an everlasting legacy of what it means to be a perfect human being. America would not see his like again.